So in this lecture, we're going to take what we learned in the previous lecture, basically the uh, we wound up deriving the uh, the Boltzmann expression. This S is equal to K natural log omega. And we're going to apply it to thermodynamic systems and understand their evolution in terms of uh, heat flow, equilibrium, and change in entropy. So let's, let's begin by, by thinking about a simple case in which we have two systems that are in uh, contact with some type of insulation. So you have some type of insulating wall. So this is going to be system A. This is going to be system B. So system A will have energy A, and system B will have energy B. And system A, in the state that it's in, the number of microstates of that uh, state of that macro state is going to be omega A, and system B will be omega B. So we have this uh, insulation between them. So now we can take and remove that insulation to allow heat flow between them. So we're going to say that there's no work, but it's all just heat flow and will allow these to come to equilibrium. We have the combined system, and the combined uh, number of microstates is going to be omega A times omega B. And you can think about that uh, in terms of your system A having uh, omega, well, you pick one of those, and then there are omega B possible microstates in system B that can pair with that. And then you would increment system A forward one and then go through all the microstates in system B. So you can see how that is going to be the total uh, number of microstates of this now combined system. But let's say that we remove the insulation between them and allow the heat to flow. Well, that means that the systems are changing. And if they're changing, then that means the number of microstates in A, we'll, we'll keep a, our uh, imaginary wall here between them, uh, the number of microstates in A and the number of microstates in B are changing, and so does the total number of microstates in the system. So imagine that heat flows from A into B. Well, we're saying that no work is being done, which means that the process of heat flow means the energy <clears throat> of B is going up and necessarily also the number of microstates, right? And we had an expression for this, right? In the, in the previous lecture, we had an expression that went something along the lines of uh, uh, D natural log omega goes as the uh, variation in U for KT, right? So that's how we know that as the uh, energy is going up, so is the number of microstates. And at the same time, 
the energy of A is going down, and therefore omega A is also going down. And we have then also that the uh, stability criteria was that we've maximized our total number of microstates in the system, right? Which we have here as the product. And going back to uh, what we had before, we've got the uh, variation in the natural log of the product of A and B omega equal to zero. Right, so we're saying that we're at an extrema because infinitesimal changes to this uh, are constant. Well, we also have conservation of energy, right? So we know that UA plus UB is equal to a constant. So let's say that uh, A and B begin with temperatures TA and temperatures TB, and those are not equal to each other, right? And what did we say? We said that uh, heat's flowing from A into B, right? Well, that means that then <clears throat> we also know that, whoops. TA is larger than TB if uh, heat flows A into B. We know that as well. But let's go back and uh, write out what happens because we know that the temperature of A and the temperature of B are different. Well, knowing this, allows us to talk about the variance of the natural log of A, and that's going to go as dQA over kT, and d natural log of omega B goes as qB over kT, and that was from the previous lecture as well. And we know that the heat flow has to be equal. So we know that, or equal and opposite, we know that dQA is equal to negative dQB is equal to, we're just going to call this dQ. So we have, we have this. We have this, and we have this, which we can then combine to say that the variance in the natural log of omega A times omega B is equal to, using the properties of logarithms, natural log of omega A plus the variance of natural log of omega B, and then substituting, that is 1 over TA minus 1 over the temperature in B, DQ over K is equal to 0. So the only way that this can be true only when TA is equal to TB, right? Because we know this is not equal to zero. So this is giving our condition for stability. And, you know, we knew this before, right? So this is uh, confirming what we know. And this also gives us this 
S is equal to S A plus S B equals A constant. Well, this is true, you know, if it's reversible. And if it's irreversible, else, then we're creating entropy. So SA dot SB uh, is not, uh, not just a summation. if it's irreversible. And you think, well, what does that mean? Well, to be irreversible, means to move from a lower probability state to a higher probability state. Oops. Lower to a higher state. It's not probably not obvious to you from what I just showed you, but by the end of the lecture, I, I hope that it's clear where this comes from. The way we're going to move forward in this lecture is through counting some relatively small systems and understand how to think about the probability of finding a system in a particular state. Now, the example that we started out with, we were talking about energy systems in which you had energies and you had occupations of these energy levels. And in this type of entropy, Occupying energy levels, for example, these are vibrational states, are called thermal entropy. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about next is called configurational entropy. And configurational entropy is just how atom types can occupy positions in space, uh, how things are configured. And this is essential for what we're going to study in terms of alloying, but it is actually one of the major types of, of entropy. And we'll talk about the different types uh, in a little bit. But for now, I, I, I want to just think of a perfect lattice. And we're going to work with a perfect lattice because uh, huh, well, we're going to work with a perfect, perfect lattice because when you start getting off the lattice, then we're adding some complexity. And let's, let's imagine a perfect lattice of four sites that can be occupied. And let's say we have A atoms and B atoms. So we have one system in which all the lattice sites are occupied with A atoms. And we have a second system of four in which all the sites are occupied with B type atoms. Now we're going to take these and we're going to bring them into contact. I've got A, 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 and here I've got B, 
B, B, B. And now I want to think about the different ways that they can be configured. And we're going to, again, keep that imaginary wall between them, but the wall doesn't exist. So the atoms can still move around, presumably. So how many ways can we make this? Well, let's say, and we're going to use a labeling scheme here for zero. This is a situation in which we have, <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Four A atoms on the left and zero A on the right. Well, there's one way to get this, right? Because if you're counting, there's only one way to get all four sides occupied with A and only one way to get all four with B. So now let's think about omega-3-1. So three atoms on the A, sorry, three A atoms on the left and one A atom on the right. Well, the answer is 16. And that's because we can have A, 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 B, and then A, B, B, B. And I'm going to draw these out. A, 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 B, A, 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 B, A, 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 B. So I'm, I'm leaving those, uh, the left-hand configuration the same. And then I can move the A atom around from that to A, A, A. Continuing with B, filling the others with our B atoms. So that gives us four. And then we can repeat that, except now moving our B atom to B, A, A, A. And then do the same thing, moving the B to B, A, A, A. And A, B, A, A. So that gives us a total of 16 in total. So what's, what's the math on this? Well, let's think about the left-hand side. So the left side only, we know that there's four possible ways to make A, B, A, A, right? There's four positions we can put the B atom in. Uh, what if instead we want to talk about a 2-2? Uh, two, two? What if we have A, A, B, B. Well, let's occupy the B side first. And there's four ways we could possibly put that first B side in. Okay. What about the second? Well, the second, we could put it here or here or here, which would give us, oh, which would give us B, 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 B. And that would give us possibly uh, B, B, B. Right. Erase that. So that gives us three possible sites. So that would be four ways to arrange the first site and three ways to arrange the second. So that would be four times three. However, let's imagine 
that we put our first site here. And here, and then this is the first one, we have the first site there. Let's put those in red. Well, now when I'm counting, I could put a second site there or there or there, which means we could have B, B. And these are identical because the system doesn't know anything about the order, right? We're talking about thermodynamics and we're talking about a thermodynamic state. So it's not about how the atoms got there, but just their mere existence. And as it turns out, for every possible configuration, there's two ways to get to those. So we have double counting, which means we have to take our four times three and multiply it by one half. To remove the double counting. And that's how we get to that. And what about having, uh, well, three Bs on well, not to, uh, well, I'm just going to jump to the answer here. I get four times three. So four ways to make the first site, three ways to make the second site, two ways to make the third site. And now three times two times one, double counting or triple counting. So this is four times three times two over three factorial, and that is four, which we know that from up here when we were counting the number of ways to put one B site. It's the same thing. Now we're counting the number of ways to put one A site. But this is the math for how to make that work. So what that means in practical terms is that uh, omega four zero, I'll, I'll move this down to another page. It's omega four zero is one times one. There's only one way to get all A and one way to get all B. One omega three one is four times four is sixteen. Omega two two is six times six. Right? Because that is our four times three divided by two. 36 omega 1 3 is 16 and omega 0 4 is 1 and then if you say okay these are all the possible configurations total number of possible configurations is equal to, well, the sum of these, we add these together, which adds to 70. You don't have to get it that way. You could also get it by saying, you could also say to yourself, Eight sites, four A and four B, 
that gives you 8 factorial over 4 factorial 4 factorial is equal to 70. Same thing. At the end of the day, you wind up with 70. Now, this is where the idea of moving from a lower to a higher probability comes in. This is called the ergodic theorem. And the ergodic theorem says that all states that are physically accessible have an equal probability of occurring. So you can think of this, if you want to, as like flipping coins, right? If you f have a box of coins and you shake it and you look at it, there's a chance that it's going to take any number of configurations. And each one of those configurations has an equal probability. There is a probability that you're going to get all the coins in the box heads up or all the coins in the box heads down. But if you count the number of possible configurations of heads up and heads down, the largest number by a fairly large margin is that half of them will be up approximately and approximately half of them will be down. And, and that's what we're saying here. We're saying that if we have this lattice site and we're occupying it with A and B atoms, and we allow them to diffuse around freely, then at any given time, they have an equal probability. So what's the probability of finding omega 4, 0? Well, there's only one way to make it, and there's 70 possible configurations, so it's 1 out of 70. What's the probability of, you know, let's say uh, omega 2, 2? Well, then it's 36 out of 70, which is 51.4%. So this is, uh, this is uh, around uh, one point. 5%. So the way to think about thermodynamic systems is to imagine the system, or I guess the way that I started thinking about this when I was younger was to imagine a, a gymnasium full of systems and each system having a different configuration that was consistent with the energy and the, the mass of the original system. And I could walk through this gymnasium, and I could look at each of these possible systems, and I would make a measurement of that. And that measurement I would record, and I would be taking the averages. And in some of those systems, when I take a block of, say, copper and a, co a block of gold, and I put them in contact, when I look at them, they've got all the gold on one side, and they've got all the copper on the other. However, I only see that in one system. And the truth of the matter is, I have this astronomically large number, right? A block of copper and a block of gold. Each one has an Avogadro number of atoms. And then you say, well, how, how can I configure those? Well, I've got an Avogadro number times an Avogadro number. It, it, it just becomes really un unreasonable. Uh, well, I guess we have, I guess we have Na factorial, uh, sorry, 2 Na factorial over Na factorial, Na factorial, which is 
you know, gargantuan. So I've got one system with pure copper, pure gold at, divided by some astronomical number, which means the probability of actually observing that is pretty much zero. And this is how we think, and this is why we observe what we do observe, uh, at least from a statistical perspective, this is what we observe. Okay, so we've been counting. Let's move back to entropy. Entropy we had as S K natural log omega. Okay, let's say the system moves from state one to state two. And, you know, let's have our state one be, uh, you know, A, 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 and uh, B, 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 B. Well, then we say that delta S is equal to S2 minus S1 is equal to K natural log, uh, K, sorry, natural log of omega, two minus K natural log of omega one or K natural log of omega two over omega one. Well, we're gonna let one be perfect. So omega 1 is equal to 1. Omega 2, how do we think about omega 2? Well, it depends on the system size. And, you know, we could take this from our, our 8 atom block, but we know that omega 2 is going to be, well, If we say the maximum is omega two, right, or the, the total number of ways, then omega two is going to be the number of A atoms plus the number of B atoms vectorial divided by the number of A atoms vectorial, number of B atoms vectorial, which means delta S of configuration going to go as K natural log Na plus Nb vectorial divided by Na vectorial Nb Victorial. And this is our configurational entropy. So moving beyond that is worth pointing out that entropies add. Right? And that's, you know, a consequence of having this logarithm. But what it also means is that as we're including different forms of entropy, so I said this was our uh, configurational entropy, and when we were talking about occupying vibrational states, this, that was our thermal entropy. Well, that means that coming down here, We can talk about S total is equal to S 
to be rational plus S thermal. And that will be K natural log thermal times omega C-O-N-F, which means that our delta S total will be natural log, sorry, K natural log of omega thermal 2 omega conf 2 divided by omega thermal 1 omega conf 2. So in many regards, this means that the problem of breaking up your entropy, the problem of thinking about your entropy is how do you account the positions and configurations of states one and two do the energy levels change one to states two, right? So this is going to be your conf entropy, and this will be your thermal. So for example, if you're thinking about a chemical reaction, you can talk about how many configurations those particular molecules can take. And then you can compute or approximate the number of vibrational states that each of the reagents and products make and use those to get your configurational and thermal entropies. So let's deviate now and then or expand upon, I guess, what we're talking about and think about real material systems. The entropy, well, right here, total entropy, gonna be configurational entropy, thermal entropy, electronic ent entropy and other. So this other, this can be, you know, dielectric. It can, you know, be surfaces. It can be magnetic ordering. Uh, it can even have like spin ordering of magnets. There's lots of ways that this other can come about. Uh, we're not going to talk about that here. You can figure those out for yourself. And as it turns out, most of the time, these others are usually configurational. But for now, we'll just leave those off and just talk about these other three. Okay, so let's start with uh, configurational because we've already talked about that. And we're talking about an astronomically large number, an Avogadro number uh, of, of atoms. So the maximum number of configurations is the total, which is number of A atoms. And if you add atoms, you can figure out the math for that. But for now, we're just going to make this simple and say we have two types of atoms.
which gives us S is equal to K natural log omega is K natural log Na plus NB factorial Na factorial NB factorial. And those break up into K natural log Na plus NB factorial minus natural log, oops, Na factorial minus natural log NB factorial. And as we saw last time, it's a pretty good approximation that the Sterling approximation can be used. I had terrible handwriting. Let's try that again. Natural log of x factorial is approximately x natural log of x minus x, which means that this can be written out as k n a plus n b natural log n a plus n b minus n a plus n b by quantity minus n a natural log n a minus negative First, I put the minus, I put those, put that in parentheses. Na minus Nb natural log Nb minus Nb. And N square bracket. Okay. So with that, then this term and these terms are going to cancel. And we use that the total number of atoms is the sum of the A atoms and the B atoms. And that allows us to write this is equal to K minus Na natural log N minus NB natural log capital N uh, plus Na natural log Na plus NB natural log nb times minus 1. I took the minus 1 out so that then I have the negatives in front of the total number of atoms. And that means that I can rewrite this as s is equal to minus k Na natural log Na over N plus NB natural log NB over N. And you're going to see uh, that this is the ideal solution Which is minus R XA natural log XA plus XB natural log XB, where R is the gas constant 
is either the Boltzmann constant times Avogadro number. Okay, so. Oops. Ha. This becomes something you will see in following lectures. But you now know where it comes from. Okay, let's let's move to uh, talk about thermal entropy. Well, this comes from counting the number of vibrational modes and then occupying those based on the energy available. And that means we have to have some vibrational distribution. And we're not going to talk about this in class so much, uh, not in this class, but in, in other lectures that I have, you can see where this model comes from. It's the phonon dispersion. And graphically, this phonon dispersion will look something like this, where this is the uh, uh, reciprocal lattice that goes as 2 pi over lambda, where lambda is the frequency of the phonon wave. And here you've got the edge of the Brillouin zone. You have three modes that do something like this. Then you have a bunch of other modes, <laughs> a bunch. You have 3n minus 3 optical modes. Where n is the number of atoms in unicell. So in principle now, if you have this, you computed it or you measured it from, from uh, neutron diffraction or, or what have you, you've got this, then you should be able to integrate over all of these possible k over each one of these different modes. and determine the uh, entropy. Uh, it's easier said than done. So what we use is we use an approximation, or there's two popular approximations, but the simplest is the Einstein approximation. And what Einstein said was that this entire dispersion can be approximated as a single frequency that is independent of the value of k. So it's basically just treating all the vibrations as a single state that is, is approximately you know, an optical-like phonon. And if you do that, that makes your integration really easy, right? It's a straight line. And doing that, you get thermal entropy as a function of temperature. You need the function of temperature because you're occupying this state uh, according to the, the Boltzmann distribution. Of three times the Avogadro number, K Boltzmann, H bar, omega, Einstein. So that is the uh, Planck, reduced Planck constant. Divided by KT 
exp of h bar omega Einstein over kt minus 1 minus the natural log of 1 minus exp of minus h bar omega Einstein over kt So you need some approximation here for what this Einstein frequency is. And there's different ways to get at that. But what's nice about the Einstein expression for the thermal entropy is that, oops, if the thermal fluctuations are much larger than the the frequency of the Einstein frequency, and, and and this is the case, right? This is a single phonon. Uh, so KT, the thermal fluctuation in the rooms are typically larger than that. Then this simplifies to 3R natural log of kt over h bar omega einstein plus 1 so if you have some estimation for the stiffness of your system that's going to give you the einstein frequency and then as a function of temperature you can get the oops ha huh. sorry you can get the thermal uh, the thermal entropy now this is just one approximation the other approximation oh actually sorry next page of my notes uh, along these same lines the einstein Uh, heat capacity goes as 3n k h bar omega squared over kt. Oh, sorry. Whoops. That's h bar uh, omega Einstein quantity squared exp of h bar omega over kt divided by exp h bar omega, sorry, omega Einstein, omega Einstein over kt minus 1 quantity squared. Okay, that's Einstein. The next approximation we're going to look at is to buy and the buy assumes that the dispersion goes as 1 over the wavelength. It's going to be a straight line. It's going to be a straight line. And that straight line, it's going to be a straight line because we have that k goes as 2 pi over, over uh, lambda. And that straight line will look something like this. So that's, that's Debye. And what comes out of Dubai, skipping over a bunch of math, uh, is that at low temperatures, and I'll, I'll come back to why I'm talking low temperatures, CV Dubai is N. K, 12, pi to the fourth, 5, T over theta divide cubed. 
Okay. So I, I, I skipped, I skipped the, uh, the entropy and it's a bunch of reasons for that. But the important thing is that Einstein and Dubai both work at high temperature. However, well, at high temperatures, if you take both, CV goes as 3NK. So this is called the Dulong du uh, Petit Law. And they both work. However, at low temperatures, Dubai has temperature going as temperature to the cube. And Einstein, uh, sorry, it has to go as, uh, here, 1 over the temperature squared. We know from observation that CV versus T does that. Oops. So this goes as T to the third. So if you ever find yourself having to approximate the thermal properties of a material and you're dealing at, at moderate temperatures, high temperatures, uh, then you can totally work with Einstein and have these nice simplified expressions. However, if you're going to uh, work at low temperature, you need to think about Dubai instead because Dubai is going to get the, uh, the behavior of the heat capacities right. And, and this really has to do with the fact that in our dispersion, the high temperature range is up in here. Whereas the low temperature, you're only talking about this lower region, which is well below the frequency that Einstein was using. So uh, you, you want to make sure you, you get this right when you're, or if you find yourself working in uh, in and, and with low temperature materials. So concluding this lecture, I want to talk about electronic entropy. And electronic entropy, this is very similar to configurational or thermal, because again, we're talking about states, the states are being occupied, and we're saying, how many different ways can we occupy those, how many different ways can we occupy those uh, states, given the number of electrons that we have? So S is equal to minus K Boltzmann, sum Ni, Pi, natural log, Ti, plus 1, minus Pi, natural log 1, minus Pi. Okay, so in this expression, Ni, this is a, a multiplicity. It's basically saying how many states do we have at a particular energy level? And you know from your chemistry class that when you were talking about you know, occupying, say, you know, 1s, you had one state, 2s, here you had 2p. So you have degeneracies uh, in your energies, and that, that's going to be intrinsic in everything. So that multiplicity accounts for there being multiple states at a particular energy level. This is the probability the state is occupied
and one minus that is the probability is empty. So in line with occupying sites with A atoms or B atoms, we're now saying the site is either full or it's empty. And this site is our uh, electronic energy level. So this is the general form. Now, what goes into these? Well, what goes into these, that is the electronic density of states. And because we're dealing with an Avogadro number of electrons, many more, that summation becomes the integral. So here, we were summing over energy levels. Here, we're going to be integrating something d epsilon. So we take our energy system and we cut it up into, into little states. And those of you who've seen density of states before, you know, they, they'll look something like this. So this is the number of states, well, states per volume. Oop. And this is telling you the number of states to be occupied within a given range of energy. And what else do we have? Oh, what's the probability of being occupied? That is the Fermi Dirac distribution. So, man. PI becomes PE. So we were summing over I, which is, remember our epsilon 1, epsilon 2, dot, 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 epsilon I. Now we've replaced that with E, and PE is 1 over exp of E minus EF over KT plus 1. Okay. EF is your Fermi energy. So to remind you how things work in the quantum world, you've got a set of states and because the Pauli exclusion principle you start putting electrons in those states and you're putting them in spin up and spin down and at some point you run out of electrons and E Fermi is the energy level just above the highest occupied and the lowest unoccupied state. In your density of states, you draw it in, you know, here, for example, and all of these would be full and all of these would be empty. Uh, and and that's, that's what it is. So when we talk about the configurational entropy of electronic states, we're really talking about what's happening where an electronic state, an, an electron, is finding itself promoted. And near the Fermi level, this states, these states become kind of diffuse. That diffuse nature is described by the Fermi-Dirac distribution. So 
to write this in like the most strict terms, we would then write S electronic is equal to minus Boltzmann integral the density of states as a function of energy P E natural log of Fermi Dirac plus one minus P E and the natural log of one minus P E D E. So if you have a good measure of your density of states, which can be measured or, or computed, then you should be able to get a good estimation of the electronic density of states. I'm oh, sorry, of the, of the electronic uh, entropy. So how can we get at that? Well, you can measure it or you compute it, uh, but let's let's take an approximation. Let's say we have a free electron gas. In that case, our density of states is going to go as L cubed over 2 pi squared uh, 2m, the mass of the electron, h bar squared to the 3 halves e the one half. And that's a pretty good approximation. We can further that approximation by recognizing that we do have a huge number of states because we got a huge number of electrons, right? And all the states down here are full. And all the states up here are empty. And what that means is it means that only the states here, plus or minus kT, so k Boltzmann times the temperature, this gives you an approximation for the thermal fluctuations in the room. It's only these near the Fermi level that are actually contributing. So that's going to simplify our integral considerably, right? This integral gets a lot easier. And when everything's said and done, you get an electronic entropy, which goes as pi over 3 k Boltzmann cubed T n e Fermi. So... If you have an approximation for the density of states at E Fermi, and that's relatively easy to get, then you can approximate the electronic entropy. And it's worth pointing out, in the case of semiconductors and insulators, this is about zero. This only becomes significant when you're talking about metals. Because in metals, in metals, there are occupied states near the, e, the Fermi level. If instead you have a semiconductor or an insulator, then the Fermi level is sitting here, and you have a band gap. So you need a relatively high... Uh, energy in order to get conduction of electrons across that band gap. So this gives us some pretty good approximations to use for the electronic entropy, the thermal entropy, and the configurational entropy.